Forever lately, it seems government announcements involve crisis and tragedy. But last month, a departure that we probably need more than we realize. A historic motion passed proclaiming Ontario's first ever poet laureate. He is Scarborough, Ontario's own Randall Ajay. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm great. I'm also in Scarborough, so, you know, this might, this might be a first for uh, TVO. Two Scarboreans into talking to each other? I don't know. It's incredible. <laughs> Scarborough to the world. Scarborough to the world. It's so great. Um, you know, but first off, congratulations. Uh, what does it mean to you on a personal level to be chosen as Ontario's first ever Poet Laureate? I think on a personal level, uh, I'm excited. It means so much to me. And I think what it really means is that more poets across the province see that this is actually an opportunity for them to continue doing the work that they do. Uh, it means that I've, I feel like I've worked so hard. A lot of people are only seeing the results, but don't know all the work that has been put in behind the scenes. Um, and I remember a lot of folks that doubted me and told me that uh, this wasn't something that was um, good, wasn't something I should have done, that I was too smart to do poetry. And I think when you follow your vision, there's something quite beautiful about that. That's very interesting that um, people doubted you. Looking back now, why do you think they doubted you? They, I, I look back on some people saying I was too smart. Uh, some people who just didn't see the vision as far as poetry being um, an opportunity or a tool or like I guess a path for success. And it was kind of discouraging, but it was my vision and, and I'm glad to see it come to light. It's interesting that you said that people discourage you from becoming a poet because you're too smart. Shakespeare, you know, was a poet, and I don't know if people ever said that he was too smart. Do you think that maybe a part of it is what people um, think a poet should look like? I think there is a part of that as well, too. And it, it may have some stigma around, you know, the artist's life, the artist's way. You know, being an artist isn't an easy path. Um, but I feel like a lot of folks were encouraging me to go the easy path, the path that would have actually guaranteed me a certain amount of income or a certain level of, of stature. Um, but I think more so than anything, you know, just this opportunity to be here, I think it does, representation is important. And for other young uh, Black men and women or boys and girls who are, you know, really looking to take their art to the next level, really inspired can be inspired by this moment and i think it's quite beautiful to to be in this position you mentioned uh that people tried to sway you from becoming a poet because you know the artist life is hard and this past year during the pandemic i think it's hit artists in such a a, a more monumental way than we realize what's it been like what's it been like for you as an artist to navigate the pandemic well you know nina simone says as an artist we have the responsibility to talk about what's happening during our time and you know in society and i think equally it's important for a poet you know to recognize that there's an opportunity here where our words can inspire where our words can bring us together where our words can galvanize and really allow folks to recognize that there's there is more although we're in this together that we can't overcome so it was difficult for me i'm not going to lie as a poet not being able to be on stage and be in the community and work with students and work with young people. It was challenging. At the same time, I think there's something quite special about looking inward. Uh, it gave me the opportunity to do some introspection, to reflect on my purpose, my life, and where I'm heading in life. Um, and I also got to work on some childhood trauma, which gave me the opportunity to write. Uh, and that's the thing about poetry. I think poetry can be a cathartic uh, release. You mentioned uh, this time has allowed you for some introspection. What have you learned about yourself this past year? I've learned that there's a, a little boy inside of me <laughs> that has dealt with a lot of adversity and a lot of challenges and that he still needs some healing and that this little boy uh, just was really looking, you know, for a hug for a, for a long time. But I think what it's also taught me is about my, my level of resilience. And that introspection, I believe, can be one of the best, you know, things because I guess there's 7 billion different ways to look at life. And we all have an opportunity to look at it in a very unique way. And so when you can show up as yourself, as your authentic self, and really deepen your sense of identity, there's something quite powerful about that. So I've learned that no matter how far I go, that there's still so much more to go. And even, even with this appointment, I'm excited, but... I think the pandemic's just taught me just just um, stay the course, stay present and stay the course. 
this post is a two year post. So hopefully by this time, the second year rolls around, um, the world will be very different. So what do you hope to accomplish um, in, the, in the two years that you're in this post? I've got some really inspiring poetry uh, to share. I'd love to travel the province and share some poetry and also create a platform for other poets to come up and you know, just talk about their experiences, what's happened for them. I wanna encourage more writing because I do think writing is cathartic. I think poetry is cathartic. And the great thing about poetry, I've been saying this quite a bit, is it really allows us to have dialogue that normal conversation doesn't necessarily allow us to, to have. And so by traveling the province, encouraging other poets and other writers to pick up the pen, I'm also hoping to, you know, go to schools, different school boards and bring poetry into the classroom because it, it, it literally saved my life. How did it save your life? Uh, so I was a grade eight student. I was um, just really angry, not sure about what was happening in my life, still dealing with some, you know, personal issues that were happening with me. And the opportunity was meeting in my grade eight teacher and her giving me a pen and a paper and she said tell me your story and that pen you know literally helped me tell my story and that paper listened when no one else would i was that troubled young young man that no one wanted to listen to i got written off many times and so it saved my life because it allowed me to tell my story it allowed me to recognize that although i've been here that i have so much more to do and so much further to go and even more so for the first time i really felt like i really felt understood for the first time how did you feel understood? I felt as though no one judged me for my story. Um, the paper didn't judge me for what I had to say. That teacher didn't judge me for what I had to say. And I think it also reminded me that poetry can be just a very um, enlightening, you know, artistic form or introspective artistic form. And so just feeling understood, feeling like I belonged for the first time, feeling like there was something that I could do that was deep, something deep in, in me that just woke up and was alive. Um, this, uh, you mentioned your grade eight teacher, you had the opportunity mm -hmm. to speak to them this week. Um, how, what, how is, how did the conversation go? Uh, you know, we've been texting back and forth for a little bit and uh, we're going to connect again soon. And the conversation was just, you know, a lot of pride and a lot of joy. She feels really grateful to have played such a role in my life. And she doesn't even really like take any credit. She just kind of like, you know, uh, it was her second year of teaching and she just kind of did what uh, innately felt right. But a lot of it is like, I'm proud of you. I'm happy for you and can, you know, uh, we're gonna be working together. I'm gonna go to her school that she's now a principal at and uh, work with her to see what we can do at her school. A full circle moment as they say, right? Full circle indeed. Yeah. <laughs> full circle so indeed. you can maybe inspire other kids that might be in your position, uh, the position that you were in. That's the goal. And I think educators and teachers have this immense opportunity. You know, it, I know it's difficult for teachers and educators at this point in time to teach online and teach virtually uh, when you're not able to really connect with students on that level. But at the same time, I think there's an, uh, an immense opportunity that, that teachers and educators have. And as an educator, that's exactly what I'm hoping to do. I'm really hoping to uh, bring this in the classroom and uh, provide tools, provide opportunities for young people to deepen their, their sense of self-identity. Um, you talked about poetry and being able to connect uh, with people and somebody that a lot of Canadians connected with was Gore Downey, who was the, the Tragically Hips lead singer. How is he connected to this new position? Uh, well, first of all, this is, this, this is in his legacy, in his honor. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for his legacy, the poetry he wrote. I feel like the connection between our work is that we've seen social justice issues and we were just folks who just knew that our poetry and our words could at least raise awareness or that we could advocate or speak out for the injustice that was happening. I had the pleasure of speaking with his daughter and two brothers yesterday, uh, Michael, Patrick and Willow. And, you know, I, I, I got welcomed into the family. Uh, it was a very beautiful moment for me just to talk to them and listen to them and learn more about Gord from their perspective. Um, so, you know, thinking about Gord, I'm grateful, I'm honored, and I wanna just continue and further his legacy. Um, I don't wanna put you on, a, on the spot, but I mean, you are a poet, you are an artist, and this past year, we've dealt with a lot of um, difficult news. A lot of people have lost so much and are continuing to lose so much. I just wanted to see, you know, um, 
if maybe you could uh, offer us some words of wisdom through a poem for us, for our audience. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have this poem, I'm thinking about two things. There's one poem that I have called Brokenness and another one I'll call The Power of the Tongue. Um, but I think brokenness is fitting, you know, for those who are listening, I think this might be fitting for, for them. Um, you know, in life, I realized that no matter the color of our skin, how much money we have in our pocket, who we are, how good we are, how not so good we are in, in life, we're all going to experience some sort of adversity. And I think the thing is with adversity is it doesn't discriminate, but it's not necessarily about us being bad people or deserving these negative things. I think it's more so that there's an opportunity to grow and there's an opportunity to heal. So um, this is a poem called Brokenness. There are too many broken people, broke into pieces they think they cannot fix. Like a shattered glass, they may cut you when you try to uplift, slicing the helping hands, hoping to heal the harm that's happened to them. They often hurt in silence. Smile in your face today, but tomorrow you may hear of how their brokenness has escalated into acts of violence. We often judge these broken people and then call them names, label them sometimes forgetting that like flipping a coin, they too can change. But what does it really mean to be broken when it is broken people that have helped mend the world? I realize that in our brokenness is when our true lives unfurl. Because see, brokenness, brokenness is a sign of recreation. It is a sign of growth. But we fear brokenness because we fear the unknown and uncertainty. For brokenness can piece our holes together perfectly, sometimes permanently. After all, if you have never known brokenness, then how would you know when you are whole? If you've never been broken, then how? Would you measure your growth? Thank you. That was incredible. Um, and I want to go back to that last line. If you've never experienced brokenness, how can you measure growth? How um, can you expand more on that line? I'm sure I mangled it because that was uh, really emotional. And I think um, it's going to help a lot of people. So can you talk more about that last line? I think there's something to be said about the notion of brokenness in this society that, you know, wants to see us as perfect, that doesn't want us to wear our emotions, that doesn't want us to be vulnerable. Um, and I think something about society, about poetry that I've learned and life in general that I've learned is that all of us, all of us have gone through stuff. We've all been traumatized in one way, shape or form. And so my perspective is what do you do with the trauma? How do you move forward? So again, it's kind of this dichotomy of, how do you appreciate the good things in life if you haven't experienced the bad? I think we're more grateful for the good things in life after overcoming some of those bad things. And it's not to say that you deserve it, you deserve it to happen, but I think it's more so that we can only really measure how far we've come when we can look back at where we've been. Um, I wanna ask you something, and obviously you don't have to talk about it if you don't feel comfortable, um, but there was a time in your life when you went you had the opportunity to, um, you were playing basketball, you had the opportunity to, uh, you know, see the world. You had, uh, you had this really great summer. Uh, one of the places that you went to was, uh, you went to India. Um, you come back, you were valid Victorian and everything was going great. And then uh, Caravana weekend, something happened to you. And again, you don't have to talk about it if you don't feel comfortable, but I, the reason why I brought it up is that um, you can, I think we all encounter certain things in our lives and we are given two choices. You can stop and kind of just fall apart or you can, you know, feel the things that you need to feel and then find a way to move forward. And I think this pandemic has been one of those things where you're just trying to find that thing to help you um move forward because everything just feels out of your own control. So I, again, if you don't want to talk about it, you can tell me, Nam, beat it. <laughs> but I just wanted to ask you, you know, how did you find the, what happened and how did you find um, the strength, uh, the, uh, I guess the foresight to kind of push through it and move forward? Yeah, Nam, you know, I don't mind sharing. It's a part of my journey that I've experienced. And I think uh, more so what I've learned about my life is my story is my story. I can't change it, uh, but I'm grateful for it because it allowed me to be the man I am today. So it was the summer of 2009. 
it was August 3rd. And essentially what happened was a few of my friends went out to go celebrate, you know, it was a month before I was about to start university. And I remember leaving the club and essentially what happened was I was robbed. My three of my friends were robbed by a group of guys. And, you know, they stabbed me in my elbow and they also stabbed me in my back as well too. And it was probably one of the most, uh, one of the worst experiences that ever happened to me, mainly because these guys took my stuff and then they they, they tried to stab me and, and, and take my life that night. Uh, as difficult as that experience was, I remember after what happened was my friends wanted to retaliate. And I thought, well, my friends who wanna retaliate are not too different from the guys who attacked me because violence was the way that they were using um, they were using violence to deal with their issues. And so essentially what I realized was that if my friends felt comfortable to use violence as a way to deal with their issues or my issue <laughs> to be to be exact, uh, there's something to be said about these hurt and broken people in society that feel like it's okay to attack people, to stab people. So I, I wonder what could I do? How could I give back so that there's a, the next young man doesn't have to deal with I, what I dealt with because you like there's a notion that hurt people hurt people and that these guys only did what they did to me because they were hurt and i'm sure they're dealing with their own traumatic experiences so i had some empathy for them you know because they they reminded me of my friends and so starting rise was exactly what i did there's something called design thinking and design thinking is really looking at a problem and asking you know once you look at the problem really deepening your understanding of the problem where you can fall in love with the problem and i fell in love with this problem of violence in our city and the lack of safe spaces for young people. And so that's how I created RISE. RISE is a, you know, a, a not-for-profit organization, social enterprise that really looks to create safe spaces for young people to express themselves in a positive way. Because in my research, what I've learned is a lot of young people turn to violence because they have trauma that is festered inside of them. And so that's essentially what happened to me, but it ended up becoming one of the best things that happened to me, ironically, <laughs> because um, I, I guess I believe that all of us are alchemists that we can all take rocky moments and turn those rocky moments into golden opportunities. I'm so sorry that you went through that. And I'm very, very glad that you're still here uh, to do this important work. Um, mm -hmm. And The Alchemist, one of my favorites, Paolo Coelho, um, <laughs> one of my favorite books. Um, you know, you mentioned Rise, and you just kind of threw it out there. But Rise has become, before the pandemic, it was uh, an important part of your neighborhood. Um, you know, looking back, how do you think RISE has helped the community? So when I think about what RISE has done in the community, when I think about how it's been a pillar for so many young people who are looking for an opportunity to express themselves, an opportunity to heal, an opportunity to connect with other young like-minded folks, um, or just an opportunity to, to be inspired, to kind of push forward through the challenges that they've been going through. Uh, it, it was a very important part of our community because it was a weekly event where it's the same place, the same time. You didn't necessarily have to pay to get in. It was just more so uh, looking like, I think what I love the most of Arise is people would travel all the way from Brampton. I mean, literally would travel from Brampton. And, and that's far. Like, <laughs> Oshawa, I'm, I'm telling you to come to Malvern, you know, yeah. and they would travel and sometimes they would leave only to catch the last bus or miss the last bus. And, and I guess it goes to show that young people really needed this, you know, it was so important and vital in the community. So um, just really quickly, we started off by building the safe space. And after young people continued to come, they were looking to learn more about being an artist. So we started an initiative where we would teach them about the business of being an artist. Uh, the business of being a professional artist and getting them connected to mentors such as Mark Stoddard as well. And um, the third the third portion of it is we wanted to employ them and give them opportunities to go out there and get paid. So whether it was connecting them with the city of Toronto or connecting them to different corporations so that they could perform and get paid, uh, that was essentially what we decided to do because um, it was needed, you know, it was really needed to let them know that your art matters, your art is meaningful. And it does matter. Uh, Randall, thank you so much for spending some time with us. Uh, I, I We're all so proud of you and can't wait to see the things that you do as Ontario's first ever poet laureate. Uh, congratulations and yay, Scarborough! <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Nam. I appreciate it.
The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.